All those in favor of amending the minutes to read impartiality rather than partiality, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, signify by saying nay. Any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion carries. Are there any other points of discussion on the minutes? These are the minutes from October 3rd. Seeing none, we'll now move into a vote on the approval of the minutes. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, signify by saying nay. Any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The motion carries. Now we'll move into reports. Uh, the first report is the report of the student development chair. You can just have the mic right there. Yeah. You can turn it around to face the rest of the room. You may need to switch it on. Hello, it's on. Hi everyone. Um, I wasn't at the last Senate meeting, so I'll introduce myself real quickly. My name is Sabera Hassan. I'm the chair of the Student Development Committee, and the mission of my committee is to promote diversity, inclusivity, and campus spirit here at UConn. And we meet Thursdays at 5 o'clock p.m., so we're meeting tomorrow, so we meet in the SOC conference room. So I urge you all to attend and be passionate about diversity and inclusivity. So we're working on two important initiatives right now. The first one is we're starting our Beauty and Diversity series. So um, we'll be tabling um, on Monday, October 22nd, in the Student Union from 12 to 3 p.m. And we'll, it's, we're doing two things. So we'll have one survey, and we're asking students about campus climate, how they feel, um, have they experienced any discrimination, and what um, action can the USG take to um, like basically protect UConn students and make it a safe environment. And the second part is, so each um, series will have a theme. So on Monday, we'll have fall colored um, leaves. And on those leaves, like students can answer what they believe is the importance of diversity. And then the second initiative we're working on is the South Campus Commons Project. So if any of you know where um, South Dining Hall, from the walkway from South Dining Hall to the library is called Academic Way. And then between the walkway, there's two um, like plot lands, like land plots. And basically, they're doing um, reconstruction there. And um, I actually met with the university architect today. And he updated me on the plans. And basically, that walkway, we just want to promote the um, importance of diversity and campus spirit to have like maybe a tagline somewhere along the walkway. So we're working closely with them. So we do a lot of initiatives with both administration and different um, facilities. So um, please join our committee if you're interested. But that's our what our semester is looking, at, looking like for now. Thank you. Are there any questions for the student development chair? Seeing none, we'll move into the report of the student services chair. Hey guys, um, so Mental Illness Awareness Week went very well. We had four events, two guest speaker nights, and one suicide prevention training uh, throughout the week. I've gotten a lot of great uh, feedback from students, faculty, and even outside organizations. Um, a big thank you to Omar, who is not here, I think, um, for a very well executed PR campaign. And a big thank you to the Daily Campus for covering uh, four news articles about us. Um, so, yeah. Um, earlier today, Senator Knight, uh, Sustainability Subcommittee Chairperson Kaufman, and I, as well as two representatives from PERBS, Zero Waste Campaign met with Mr. Jedmack uh, to increase transparency of trash and recycling receptacles around campus, especially at parking lots. So we proposed an initiative to place more trash cans and recycling bins at strategic areas around campus by moving um, trash cans that are already in like less visible areas currently. So the initiative was well received and we'll be collaborating with facilities to follow through with this project. Moving forward, uh, the Sustainability Subcommittee will work with PERG to identify high traffic locations um, to strategically place trash and recycling receptacles. Um, facilities gave us a rough timeline of the end of the semester or early next semester as the completion date. And, <coughs> 
Finally, student services will be uh, coordinating efforts with the cultural centers for the Tampa Time event, which will be on November 15th. We'll be working with Omar and the PR team to help advertise the event. Any questions? Thank you. Seeing no questions for the student services chair, we'll now move into the report of the academic affairs chair. Seeing no report from the academic affairs chair, we'll now move into the report of the external affairs chair. All right, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so in external affairs, I know a big thing that happened just yesterday uh, was we finally had our attorney general forum, and it, it went really well. Uh, we had the Democrat William Tong and the Green Party candidate Peter Gosselin come and have a very engaging discussion. I'd like to thank everyone on my committee, especially Matt Sansowitz, Caleb, and Kelsey, both Senator Moore and Senator McCormick for all of their help yesterday and throughout this process they've been a huge help and I'm really thankful for all that they've done with this. It has been something that we've been looking to do for a long time, for several months, and I'm really proud of them for following through on this. Um, but for the next week in our committee, a lot of a lot of our focus will be on on um, election efforts and getting people to the polls and getting people registered to vote and knowledgeable on the election coming up in November. Um, we're having the ballot ready party next Friday. We approve money for wristbands, uh, pens, and uh, buttons for that event. We'll be handing out promotional materials for USG at that event and probably materials for the upcoming special election uh, for for the, the Senate seats that are vacant right now. Um, so that'll be a great event. And also there will be a party at the polls on election day, which we will also use to make sure that people are getting out to vote, they're engaging in the election, and that they're informed of all the choices they've had, um, they have to make coming up to election day. So a lot of that is, is what we have in our plate right now. I know Senator Fernando has been working on something uh, with plastic bags and the potential ban on them that has been uh, talked about within the Mansfield community. Um, so that'll be something else we look forward to. Um, but I know after this Attorney General event, which was a huge success, we'll be looking forward to doing more you know, community service and advocacy events like that in the future. Um, one more thing, I had the University Town Relations meeting yesterday. I attended with one of my committee members, Kyle Bodet. Um, we talked a lot about some of the upcoming construction that has been going on um, throughout the university uh, and the progression of some of the parking and bus issues. Uh, we also talked about some of the things going on within the community, especially with the uh, chief of police. Um, the chief of police in Mansfield, the resident trooper, Sergeant Timmy, um, gave a report that said that there were higher there were a higher number of incidences, but based on you know their implementation of how they're going about these issues, uh, what they've been doing is being more vigilant and reporting more of these incidents that were reported in the past. Um, so that explains that number. Um, but that's the general overview of that. Um, but I'm really looking forward to all the work we'll be doing in the coming weeks leading up to the election. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any questions for the external affairs chair? Seeing none, we'll now move into the report of the Vice Presidential Chief of Staff. Seeing no report from the VP Chief of Staff, we'll move into the report of the Presidential Chief of Staff. Seeing no report from the Presidential Chief of Staff, we'll now move into the report of the Chief Justice. Seeing there is no Chief Justice, we will now move into the report of the Speaker of the Senate. All right. So first and foremost, thank you all who were able to come out tonight and bear with us as we got the shots taken. For those of you who didn't, if you weren't here earlier, we talked about in the next day or so, there'll be an email going out uh, telling you guys when to show up to make sure we can get those pictures taken as well. All of our senators. Uh, second of all, Senate leadership now being fully compiled at its first unofficial meeting this Monday from 9 to 10. Going forward in the future, we will now have official meetings with minute takers and public comment uh, on Mondays from 9 to 10 p.m., which we understand is late, but we ask you to bear with us. If you have any, we, we're always very accessible in Senate leadership, but if you have any official 
Jake, you'd like to bring to us there or just see how that goes on, you're always welcome. Moreover, as some of you have probably noticed, uh, those of you who have had office hours already, we have been making efforts in Senate leadership to see every one of you in an individual setting and talk to you one-on-one -on -one with at least one or two members of Senate leadership, depending on your committee. If you haven't had this meeting yet, don't worry. It's probably just because your office hours haven't come by yet. We're going to make sure to keep doing that going forward. If by the end of the week you haven't met with anyone from Senate leadership, that's all right. Just send us an email. Let us know, and we'll make sure we meet with you on an individual, an individual setting. Nothing is wrong, we just want to talk to you and make sure we touch base with all of our senators. Finally, uh, if you're here right now, it's probably not an issue, but we'd just like to remind everyone that Senate, caucus, office hours, and committee attendance are all mandatory. If you send us an email uh, telling us why you cannot attend, we can work with that. But if you don't give us a reason, then there's nothing we can do. With too many excused absences will lead to dismissal from the body, which nobody wants. So. Are there any questions for me? Seeing none, we'll move into the report of the cop. <coughs> Yes, so the way it works, especially now that Senate leader, this is why it's so important to get Senate leadership set up, is an official vote comes before um, Senate leadership. Recommended uh, punitive measures are recommended by the parliamentarian, as they are the ones who oversee attendance. In this case, it would be dismissal from the bottom. Then it's up to a vote of um, the uh, Senate leadership to decide that. It's a, a two thirds vote of Senate leadership, which is a little odd because there are four members, but two thirds is the supermajority. So that would require three votes of the four members to um, approve of dismissal. Once they uh, are dismissed, it is required that I announce that at the next meeting that they have been dismissed. And if the Senate believes they should not have been dismissed, they have the power to make a motion to overturn our vote and allow them to remain in the body. Any other questions? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll move into the report of the Um, hi everyone, my name is Priyanka. If you haven't met me, I am the Urushi Comptroller. So if you see me, please feel free to say hi, introduce yourself. Um, so a few updates for me. Um, I've been working on the policies as per usual. Um, there's big changes coming. Um, we are still going through our draft currently, but um, we are hoping to have it done by the end of the semester. Um, that is our goal. Um, and hopefully at our last Senate for the semester, we will be passing it. That is the goal, um, ultimately. Um, further, because the policies are going to be changing, we're going to be having um, new funding workshops that are going to be in place, and we're trying to have these funding workshops online. So before, I'm not sure if you were aware, but these funding workshops um, were facilitated by our office staff, and unfortunately, that's not the most efficient process. Um, so like the solid desk surgery two workshops and like um, the alcohol ADU, we kind of want um, the funding workshop to be online as well with a few quizzes in the middle so that students really know their material about uh, our funding policies. Um, um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I'm trying to redo the entire funding system and basically have all the important documents on one program, which would include our um, inventory system that's not in place, um, informational budgets, and um, the system where students submit requests. And this is really big because um, that is how day-to-day um, -day operations are held through our funding system. So the new system as a whole is going to change a lot within the office. So with these new policies, and with, these, um, with this new funding system, um, a lot of changes are going to be made within um, the funding arena. So just be aware of that and let your constituents know that policies are changing, so they're not going to be the same as they were. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, we are still working on inventory. I talked to Dawn, and she and I are going to put a position up for inventory, um, and that's going to be on Job X very soon. And basically, we need inventory an inventory position to um, check up on the inventory we're giving out to state groups and so that they can be accountable for it and we know what's being allocated and what's still there. Um, any questions? Any 
questions for the council? Right. Seeing none, we'll now move into the report of the vice president. Well, so I have a couple items. I tried to write them on my hand, but that's awkward. So it's not here now. Okay, so first off, okay, so this past week on Friday, I worked with PERG. I think some other e board members or governing board members also like did a video with PERG to promote voting, did that. Um, also with LGL, so thank you everyone who filled that out. There are a couple people just like looking at the name tags that didn't fill it out. I'm looking at everyone. Everyone that I've looked at has filled it out, except Brendan. So I'm talking to later. But it seems like everyone here has filled it out. You're going to be getting your LGL um, pair by this Sunday. Um, and I'm really excited to show those off because I've just been thinking about them all the time. You guys are going to love your new best friends. Um, December, oh, and with LGL, we're going to be having a, an event for you to get to know your LGL person. It's not gonna be during caucus, I really wanted it to be, but the next open caucus is December 5th. So instead, December 5th is hopefully gonna be a holiday party, which will hopefully be the second LGL event that we'll have. But before that, I'm gonna be sending out a Google poll for to see a date that works for the most people, and it'll mostly, most likely be like on Thursday or something, and you'll be able to meet your LGL and hang out with them. And hopefully you'll be able to hang out with them like outside of that, Everyone's great. Additionally, um, we found our next um, other co-funding supervisor. Um, I don't know if I've been updating you guys on that whole process, but um, we have hired the other co-supervisor. Her name's Erin. She's great. She's a sophomore. She's super dynamic and friendly. If you're ever in the office, she can help you out. And um, she's going to be in that role for the rest of the academic year. Um, and lastly, Matt Noya. So I'm really excited to announce that I am the co-chair for the next Metanoia, and I'm doing that with um, a professor, which I'm not exactly sure if I'm allowed to talk about, and I'm not allowed to tell the theme yet. But at the next Senate, I'll be letting you guys know what that theme is, and for those of you who don't know what Metanoia is, Metanoia is like a university-wide um, celebration on a certain topic. Last year, we had it on race, and then in the fall, and then in the spring, we did it on the environment, and this spring, we're doing something else. and. Um, I'll keep you guys updated, and there's going to be room for our students to participate, and I'll let you know when those opportunities arise. That's it for me. Any questions for the Vice President? Senator Ortino. What it will be? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm thinking about doing some of the cute activities that we did last year with LGL, like get to know, yeah. So if you have any suggestions, I just want it to be like a fun thing where there's food and like you play games and just get to know them. Any other questions for the Vice President? Oh, and for you, I know some people were interested in having a USG event where we went to like Boston or New York because, um, I don't know, I don't know if we're talking about Costco, but um, because we might be doing Costco this year, the cost of that is probably not going to work as well. So if an event like that was happening, it'd be for next semester, which is why for the December 5th thing, I'm going to try to have as much input as possible to make it make up for not being able to do a trip like that. Yeah. Any questions for the Vice President? Any other questions? Seeing that, we'll move into the report of the President. The So pretend I'm Ama because she wrote this all in the first person. <laughs> um, hi everyone, sorry I couldn't be here tonight. Last week I spoke with the Vice President of Student Affairs to discuss what initiatives we will be working on. We will be inviting the Provost, Craig Kennedy, to our next student leaders meeting. Additionally, many students have indicated they want to provide feedback regarding their experiences of the Career Development Center. Therefore, we are making plans to invite the Director for Career Development to our December meeting. If you have any feedback you would like to provide, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I've heard some responses from cultural centers in regards to representatives for our next officio seats. Very exciting. I should be confirming those names very soon and bringing them to Senate. 
Finally, I've been working with Christine Savino to select another date for the Presidential Search Forum, which is what I emailed you guys about recently. The date will be October 31st from 4 to 5 p.m. right before our Senate meeting in this very ballroom. I strongly encourage everyone to attend. Student feedback is crucial in the presidential search process, and I would like USG to be as involved as possible. Please reach out to me with any questions. Have a great Senate meeting, and see you soon. Um, no questions can be answered as the president is here. Now we'll move into the report of the public relations director. Seeing no report, we will now move into old business. Seeing no new old business, we will now move into new business. First thing we're asked to consider is a vote. <laughs> the first item we are asked to consider is a joint resolution in support of Indigenous Peoples Day. Do I have a motion? Motion goes to Glass, all for second goes to Otina. Would the author of the legislation here to come speak on his behalf? that's been spearheaded by the Native American <laughs> Cultural Society and programs. And um, it was something that I offered that potentially USG could help out with. And that's where this legislation comes from. Unfortunately, they weren't able to attend today. And they haven't given me the approximate number of signatures they were able to compile. But um, it has been verified that it's over a thousand signatures that they got in three days and the numbers from the online petition haven't been counted yet, so I wish I could tell you guys exactly how many signatures that they were able to get. And um, just for clarification purposes, to reiterate, there's no way that this legislation will change a federal holiday. No university, no state can take away a federal holiday because the federal government is the one who made it that way. Um, but you can change what or you can persuade a university or a different entity to recognize something to recognize something in the way that you want it to be, which is what this legislation is essentially does. And if you look at the the resolves um, clauses, there's really only two, and it's just urging the university to recognize Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day on any calendar distributed by the university every year from the state board. So it's pretty straightforward. Are there any other points of discussion? I just want to reiterate what Mayor brought up last week um, about this. Um, I think it's a good resolution, I think. Um, it definitely, you know, Columbus definitely wasn't the greatest person. But just out of the, uh, you know, just for the purpose of the city, to make this possible, um, I know a lot of this 
time here to celebrate Columbus Day. You know, Columbus is kind of like, you know, here a lot of the time, you know, helps to take away from your migration. Instead of, you know, wiping Columbus Day and including not recognizing it, like, what if to be inclusive, we, you know, we recognize those? Because I feel like you're, you know, kind of dissing a lot of the high American who might be on this campus who celebrate Columbus Day. Uh, one thing I will say too is like, if you want to talk in the future, uh, come up at the podium. Some people just can't project as that good as others. We want to make sure. Uh, are there any other points of discussion? Senator Martina. Senate standing rules. We have a motion. 
Motion goes tonight, second goes to McCormick. All right, is there, uh, would the authors of the legislation care to come and speak on the bill? Unless you mean. Um, the only biggest, the only thing that we really wanted to change about the Senate standing rules is the time that you can now um, give in legislation to be considered at the next Senate session. So it used to be that it would be at midnight on Saturday, the Senate, or the week before the Senate to be considered. Now we want to make it so you can send it in by noon on the Sunday before. So it gives you like 12 hours more to be able to do that. Thank you. Are there any other points or motions? Seeing none, we will now move into a vote. All those in favor of a resolution regarding an amendment to the Senate standing rules, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Any abstentions? Uh, if any other chair of the ayes have, motion carries. We will now move into a bill regarding the 2018 special election package. Oh, actually, we'll go into a motion to consider this. Motion to accomplish, second to Dr. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Uh, really, I was just going to say a little about Senator Rutina just said, uh, instead of postponing it indefinitely, I recommend that we just move it down to the agenda if he's planning on the paper tonight. All right, are there any other points of discussion? Discuss this meeting. I don't want to like post on. I want senators too. Um, and I would try to do it down the agenda, but we only have one other item, so it wouldn't be that much of a delay. Um, and also, we table indefinitely. You can always edit on at any time during the meeting. So we yeah, can edit it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just to speak a little more to that on parliamentary procedure. Once we have tabled something indefinitely, it just means it's, it sits there until we motion to take it from the table. So we could. Most, if we were to, this motion were to succeed, it would sit on the table until at which point the body felt it was necessary to motion to bring it back up. And that would be a motion to take from the table. Any other points of discussion? There's a motion for the previous question. Is there a second? Second goes to Sansom. All those in favor of moving to the previous question, this means addressing, uh, moving back to a vote on question of uh, on tabling the motion. Uh, all in favor of that, please signify by saying not. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying yay. Any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have the motion carries. All right, now we will move into a vote on tabling the legislation indefinitely. All those in favor of tabling the legislation indefinitely, please signify by saying not. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying yay. Yeah. Any abstentions? Uh, someone's called the vision, so we're going to do a uh, hand vote. All those in favor of tabling the legislation, please raise your hands. Eleven votes for. All those opposed to tabling legislation, please raise your hands.
Sorry, folks. Um, sorry for the delay. I had a doctor's appointment. Um, I think Josh didn't know he could speak behind the podium because last time I did, I stole his uh, gown. I don't think he likes that very much. <laughs> okay, so um, there are two things that I, I want to do in relation to this election panel. One, I'd like to delegate. I'd like for this body to delegate to me the authority to modify the timeline. Um, Brendan Carroll, the Election Oversight Committee Chair, myself, and the speaker um, will be meeting with Krista. Um, she's a she here? No. Um, she's from Student Activities, and she runs the election system. We need to make sure that the deadlines that we propose here are actually feasible within Student Activities' you know, process for how they verify candidates and so on. That's the first thing I'd like to do. So that would I'm calling for a motion from from you folks to delegate the Chief Justice the authority to modify the election timeline. And I, I'm fine if you interrupt me with that motion. So if you'd like to, please do so. Chair would not recognize the motion. The motion goes to Martina, second goes to Glassman. The motion is to delegate the authority of adjusting the timeline to the Chief Justice. So right now the timeline is laid out specifically in the election packet. This would change all, remove all that, and change it to be the authority to change that is now given to the Chief Justice. Yeah. Uh, uh, this body, uh, once we pass this packet, no one has the authority. Only this body would have the power to change the, um, the way it's laid out. Majority. It's just an amendment. We can delegate any authority we see fit in this matter, provided it does not violate the title of the Constitution. Okay. So, um, it's, we're not editing this document. We're editing the motion that's used to pass this document. Uh, how does the amendment read? Uh, so I'm just proposing an amendment. Yeah, I can, you can yeah. I'll yield to you. So you the motion should read. Uh, can, can we take a look at the main motion and vote that way? But we're looking at the right things. So yeah, the main motion vote is just to we accept the election packet as proposed. Uh, okay, so we would say, um, okay, um, that the undergraduate student government approves the election packet accompanying this document as proposed and grants the Chief Justice the authority to modify the election timeline section of this document. So you would just modify that, therefore, be resolved in that. Is the proposed amendment to this document? For now, I'll, I'll yield. Yeah, so we can move on. Yeah. Is Chief Justice the authority to modify the election timeline section of this document? And I'll yield my. I'll yield to the chair to discuss this. So this is the motion that is on the floor. Are there any points of discussion on the amendment? Senator Carroll. So although I agree with Chief Justice Tumo that we need to meet with student affairs first before we uh, officially set this elections policy, I do think it's a dangerous precedent to give the Chief Justice the power to set that uh, timeline because per the bylaws, uh, what was it, 8? Yeah, bylaw 8, uh, section 2.3, the judiciary's primary role in the elections is to uh, receive any of the election policy violations that the EOC sends to them. So I feel like this would be kind of an overstepping of the judiciary on the EOC because per that same section 2.1, uh, the EOC is responsible for setting all policies governing elections for the USG. So I think setting that timeline would be something that me and my committee would be working on. And although I completely agree with the points that Chief Justice Toomey made, I don't think it's within uh, his purview to make those edits. So I would discourage you from allowing this bill to go forward, or this motion to go forward. I'll yield. Are there any other points of discussion on this motion? Justice Toomey. So, 
in, 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 in large part, I agree with you, but this is, this is a special kind of situation. So I called this election under my constitutional authority to call special elections. Um, and setting the timeline is part of calling that election. One. Two, the Elections Oversight Committee derives the power to oversee um, the elections from the judiciary itself. So I don't think it would be an overstepping of the bounds, especially given that the constitutional authority to have an election and to monitor an election and to certify the results of an election go to the judiciary anyway. So I see your point, but I'm going to have to respectfully disagree and say that granting the Chief Justice the authority to change the timeline based on a meeting that they're having with student affairs, purely logistical matter, you're not granting me the authority to change anything of substance, and all of the policy has been moved to the bylaws anyway. So I do not have the authority, and I cannot, under, under this motion, make any substantive changes to election policy. I can only make changes to the election timeline. And I called the election under my constitutional authority, and my branch is the one that's responsible for having elections in the first place. Okay. I will yield to the Chief Justice of the Uh No, this motion has a brief delegates the authority to me. I was elected by and from the justices, just like the Speaker was elected by and from all of you. Um, it's a logistical change. I really don't think we're going to encounter a slippery slope here. And first off, the slippery slope fallacy is called a fallacy for, because it's a fallacy. It's not. It's not valid. I'll yield. Here, I'll know you had your chairperson. Carol, I know you had your placard up, so you may go through it or something. Uh, I'm Jane Contreras, and Senator Bernard Jefferson. Uh, uh, you have a motion. Motion. Is a motion to move to the previous question. Is there a second to this motion? Senator Glassman, just to clarify again, this we are now moving, we are now voting to move back into a vote on the amendment proposed. If by voting for this you have, you have voted to end discussion, I just want to clarify that fact. Is there any discussion on this motion? Seeing none, we'll move into a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Nay. Any abstentions? Okay, this division is called. So now we're going to uh, do hand voting. All those in favor of moving to the previous question, raise your hands. All those opposed to moving to the previous question, please, please raise your hands. You motion to move to the previous question. The previous oh, question we're moving. So I vote yes. <laughs> okay. So all those opposed, please keep your hands raised. Okay. <laughs> it's actually a great example of how. Yeah. Well, he says. <clears throat> so, this is a great example of how we can get really binded up in parliamentary procedures sometimes. So, there was an amendment made to the original bill, delegating the, the Chief Justice the authority to change the election times. We were having discussion on that. Chairperson Reynolds felt that all the discussion had been exhausted. So he motioned for the previous question, which means if you're just motioning to end debate. If you feel that everything is, has been said, you would vote for his motion. This does not mean you vote for the amendment. It just means you think that everything's been said already and we should move back into discussion on the amendment. Does that answer your question? Right. So since all that got thrown into a, a, a bind, we're going to do the vote again. All those in favor of moving to the previous question, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Okay. So that's
has 18 people voting for. All against, all, all, all who are against the motion of moving to the previous question. One, two, three. All right, any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, uh, are there people who did not cast a vote? Right, so whatever, the, bat, the vote passes, uh, yeah, yeah, most, the motion passes 18 to 3 to 0. Now we move back into a vote on uh, the amendment to the bill, which proposes that we delegate the authority to change the election timeline to the Chief Justice. All those in favor of delegating that authority to the Chief Justice, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, the eyes have some issue here. All right. Now, I will once again yield to the Chief Justice so that he may bring up his second point about the election. Uh, okay, so thank you. Um, I will be working with Chairperson Carroll and Speaker Pro to handle the timeline anyway. So um, even if you have concerns, rest assured, they'll keep me honest. Okay. <laughs> Second thing, uh, it was recently brought to my attention that a candidate who completed uh, all of the qualification steps necessary, uh, uh, he goes by Jackie Zang, he lived in Northwood, and he ran for Northwood Senator, um, did not show up on the list of tabulated results that I received. Um, I want to go track this down. If the votes were lost, I want this body to help me by granting the permission for this candidate to run again in this special election without having to complete those qualification steps that they've already done. They've already been cleared as a candidate by student activities, but we don't have the votes for that race. And that's something that's messed up in you contact or lost in communication. I want to get to the bottom of it. If we get the results back, it is within my authority as the person who certifies election results to declare him the winner of that race. However, if those election results were lost, I don't want the candidate to have to go through the trouble of re-qualifying again when they've already done that. It, the problem is with USG and student activities, it's, it's our fault that those votes were lost. So I'd like your permission to rectify that, and I'd like you to grant me the authority to add, uh, I think his his legal name is X U E Z H I Z H A N G is his last name. Uh, to the list of candidates for the the special, the special election, election special election 2018 uh, for the Northwood constituency. Yes. Um, so do you mean that the candidate would not have to do things like uh, appears again? Yes, because they've already completed the petition by years. One of information. Yes. Was this candidate that ran, um, were they qualified for the ballot or were they writing? They were qualified for the ballot. Their bio was posted on the voting page, but the results didn't show up on the other end. And that's a concern. Any further questions? Was that election contested, or was there something you know? To my knowledge, it was not. Um, but we have to go through and make sure that there wasn't a right candidate with more votes. There, there weren't. We have to get the election results for that constituency, and right now we don't have that. So that's the thing. Um, yes. The motion is to Grant the Chief Justice the authority, or Brenda, do you want this? Yeah. To grant the Elections Oversight Committee the authority to add um, XUE. 
I, I know he goes by Jack. We live together. <laughs> and yeah, I want to grant EOC the uh, power to add Jackie Zhang to the ballot um, of the 2018 special election. If so, what I want to do is grant him the authority to do it, but I don't want him to do it just yet. Because if we get to the bottom of this and we have the election results somewhere, there's no need to do that because we'll already have the election results. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Is there such a motion? Uh, we haven't even made the motion yet. So, point of information. How would that do this? So, so I think it's a problem that's going to be redundant. Motion. Yeah. Second goes to last one. Five. So, could some? Could you? Could the chief justice stand up and repeat the motion he is asking for, so that we may know what is being motioned. Uh, I would like to add a therefore it be resolved clause that reads: Therefore it be resolved that the undergraduate student government the senate resolves to. Delegate the authority to the, or grant the authority to the Election Oversight Committee Chair to add candidate Jackie Zhang here, okay, he just, here has a name, to the ballot for the Northwood constituency in the, the fall 2018 special election. of discussion on this amendment. Uh, point Transparency to the body. I did just check. We do have uh, the petition of peers and the uh, basically the necessary forms to have this candidate on the ballot. So I do think this was probably an issue with uh, student affairs. I think the votes didn't come to the EOC or to the judiciary, or they were not placed on the ballot in the first place. But uh, we do have all their information. They were confirmed uh, by student affairs to be able to run. So uh, I support this completely, and I see no reason as to why we should make them redo everything. They have to do to apply when we have verification of all the methods that we have. So I would encourage you to definitely vote for this motion. I'll yield. Any other points of discussion? Senator Beal? Hi, so I'm uh, very much in favor of this amendment. Um, I just kind of want to make a point that Speaker Toon mentioned that. Uh, excuse me. Chief Justice. Mentioned that uh, Mr. Jang, yes? Did you say he lives with you? He used to. Oh, okay. So I was I was worried for a moment that there might be a conflict of interest, but I feel like if that like the there's been a confirmation that he did one hundred percent qualify for the ballot and it was a failure on our end, um, he or student affairs, and then he more than deserves to uh, have his foot on the bell. If anyone else knows anything about something like this that's happened to another candidate, please bring it to our attention. We don't know unless people bring it to our attention. That's the only reason we found out about this. 
Senator Douglas. Uh, uh, I, I just wasn't one hundred percent clear if the candidate is uh, if when we get the results back they got whatever threshold necessary. Uh, my recommendation to the judiciary will certify uh, that immediately and we will be a senator this morning and the next senator. Yeah. So the way this will work is if we find the if the judiciary finds the results, then they have the power to certify the elections. They'll be sworn in the next senator. If the results are not found, this delegates the EOC the power to put their name on the ballot because we already have all the forms. Are there any other points of discussion on this amendment? Right. Seeing none, we will move into a vote. All those in favor of this amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. <laughs> we have not yet passed the actual packet, so we'll get to it, so Now we move back into the consideration of the packet as a whole. Okay, I have a motion, actually, one. My first motion is to um, correct the spelling under open positions for special election in 2018. Rackham, the senators, Rackham spelled with the end. Is there a second to that amendment? Second goes tonight. Does the author of the bill accept it as friendly? Seeing it's kept it as friendly, we don't need to have a vote. Motion to amend. We have a motion to amend. Um, I think we put 2016 special elections under the ball. Is there a second to this? Uh, second goes to 14. And it looks like the author accepts it as friendly. Uh -huh. special Senate session, which would last five to ten minutes most, the only item on the agenda would be to have that back. Rather than delegating authority or any sort of thing of that nature, let's just strike it, and if it's a problem, we'll deal with it as a result. I'll go back to myself. 
Any other points or motions? So, have you, did you? Um, quick word. Uh, last clause is needed finally. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, second goes to the Quick order. Can I solve the problem with Gary? Ah, yeah, that, that's correct. I will add out the order for the time being, but all of this. Uh, now, the motion is to strike the seat um, from Northwood for the time being. Remove the constituency as one listed as vacant. And that is already says. No, it wasn't. You never made the motion because it's just. So, is that your motion? Right. So, the parliamentarian has made a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, Fernando. So, this is an amendment to strike the Northwood constituency from our uh, number of seats that are available. Well, is there any discussion on this motion? Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second goes to class. Does 
the author accept this as relevant?
So there are other avenues to be involved with USG. <coughs> um, so just to clarify. Are there any other points of discussion? Seeing none, look, Senator Mink. Uh, Pat, so building off of what uh, Vice President Gatherer just said, I think that even though um, currently uh, you don't have an opportunity to run in elections, uh, you can still participate in USG. So I am against this bill or the amendment to the bylaws because I think it's really important to have that layer of separation because even if somebody's on the EOC for this academic year, the change that they'd like to make to like the election cycle and the election packets can more than likely carry over to the next year's election packet and possibly affect their elections. Um, also, I think that are most of the members in the EOC upperclassmen, presumably? Okay, so I think that it's good to have people that are upperclassmen that have more than likely already participated in elections in the past and don't necessarily have ambitions of participating in elections in the future um, to be the ones working on the EOC and deciding how to run the elections because they would have experienced them already and um, they wouldn't be searching for a re-election in the future. So, yeah, I oppose this question. Uh, um, so the point about the EOC chair possibly changing the election packet or etc. to their advantage, um, just to clarify, Senate does have the final say and does oversee all changes made. Um, so in my opinion, it would be wise for the EOC chair to try to change the packet for their advantage just because it goes back to Senate and we as a body oversee um, any changes. So I yield back to the chair. Senator, you know, the Senate does oversee the you know, election packets and everything. There could be things that we don't catch, um, and I think it would just be, you know, completely prevented if, if people in the EOC weren't allowed to work for elections, because, you know, realistically, we are not we are students in the Senate, and, you know, students aren't going to read into it and, you know, have this in the back of their head, and, hey, this changed last year, this year. And I think it would just be better for the longevity of the you know, organization and to all our elections there. If we left uh, EOC the way it was, where if you are on that committee, you can't run for elections. office. Plus, I think it gives an unfair advantage to people because they know the back end of the election and how it works. Um, and it might give an unfair advantage to somebody running in the future or no that position. Right, so again, Carol, uh, Jefferson Carroll. Uh, and then Senator Douglas, and then, oh, and then, what? Okay. And then, Senator Kalbush, and then, go ahead. So, a lot of points are being made, I'll try to remember as many of them as I can. But, uh, to Owen's point about people having kind of an inside look at how elections work, an important point to remember is that our elections are already completely transparent by request. So you can go to Student Affairs, anyone in Student Affairs or the EOC, anyone on the governing board and ask any questions regarding our elections and you'll get the answer. So in my opinion and in the opinion of Senate leadership, having previous experience on the EOC does not create any type of conflict of interest because having that knowledge of how our elections work is already kind of public information. It's just not something that everybody looks into or looks up. And then the other important point is once you're off the Elections Oversight Committee, you can't make any changes to that current, you know, so like I'm the EOC chairman for this semester and next semester, so if this bill went into effect, I would be able to apply to run for an elected position next year. But the newly elected EOC chairman is going to have to look over the elections packet and make changes to it anyway. So any type of changes are bound to be caught either by the judiciary or the EOC or even Senate leadership, or even student affairs, and we really have four different bodies that double check this. So, it, you know, I understand the concerns, absolutely, but I don't believe, and it's also, you know, the opinion of other senior members of our organization, 
that this is not a necessary restriction to have. Uh, another important point is, as you may or may not know, we're, we're kind of ushering in a new wave of senators to USG, which means we're not going to have enough juniors or seniors or essentially enough people willing to run for POC to have a functioning committee because we don't have people who are interested. So I think if we can kind of balance this properly so that the current EOC doesn't affect next year's election packets, which is kind of already the system in place right now, then I don't see how we'll have an issue. It's just we have to make sure that future EOC uh, chairman, committee members are cognizant of this So I would, uh, I would encourage you to ask any more questions you have regarding this. I can just like the other speakers listen to look beyond that. I just want to take a second to make sure uh, that everyone understands exactly what this legislation does. Uh, it does not grant any extra powers to anyone who's currently uh, sitting on the EOC. It is only uh, designed to affect few, uh, members in the future. So if you sit on the EOC this year, then while you're not sitting on it, maybe next year, you would be able to run. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I'm definitely in support of this. I, again, I'd like to point out all the empty seats, all the open positions that we have. I don't think we should be denying people that have intent to be dedicated to this organization of their ability to run. And I'd recommend to any senators or anyone in general that is sort of questioning the integrity of the EOC after this gets passed to run for EOC and probably see that there's no such problems. And the rest of my time. So, thank you. Next, we have Count Floor of Fact. Yes, the motion was the motion from that motion. What is your call on that? I'd like to add a whereas clause where um, this action and the ability for DOC members to run in elections only applies to new members of EOC, so the amendment is pretty important. Because the people that are in EOC now join knowing the rules that are in place. Uh, so there is a proposed amendment to the bill saying that uh, everyone going forward will be able to run an election, but a current members of the election oversight committee will be prevented from running in elections again. One. All right, uh, is there, uh, actually there needs to be a second to that motion before we can anyone second that motion. Uh, Senator Fernando. Point of procedure. Uh, I believe that that has to be a clause <coughs> on the therefore clause. Uh, sorry, therefore clause on the warehouse. Why? Uh, because it's, it's doing something. Okay. Uh, uh, the second to that? No. The, who's that? Uh, Fernando was second. Other, would, now we'll move into discussion. Would I care to speak on your amendment? Um, okay, so the ability to be able to run elections after being I don't know exactly how to word it, but as Deputy Speaker, I'm sure you can handle it. After um, or if this amendment was passed, the changes in effect would only um, affect new members of the committee and like essentially this amendment would be grandfathered in and people that are currently on the EOC um, would still have to abide by the rules that were in place when they joined. So I'm 
glad so for being able to brought this up because I was kind of afraid people would think that this is like a power grab move. I'm not trying to, I personally am not trying to run for any elections whatsoever, so I would be in support of this. Uh, I'm not going to accept it as friendly because I feel like that's a decision that the Senate should decide. But I do just want to also remind you that currently the EOC, which should have a minimum of five members, uh, is currently one member because we don't have people who are interested in joining the EOC. So I would just caution you to try to Make sure you find the balance between having enough members on the EOC to make sure that our elections are properly overseen, while also making sure that we have the people who are willing to do that. So uh, I do support it because I don't want anyone to think that you know this isn't about me. This is about the EOC itself. So if, if you're concerned that that's the issue, I would encourage you to vote for this. But I'd also remind you to be cognizant of the facts that uh, this is an incredibly necessary and important committee, and currently it's not. It's simply not. So I'll well, yield. It. So, uh, is there you, your next um, speaker? Uh, so, with this amendment, if he's the only member of this amendment, so all the action is to be the chairman out of the Senate. Okay, so I'll clarify this. It's not just, it, it isn't specifically target, targeting the chairman, it's saying that anyone who's serving on the EOC currently cannot run for elections, be that Senate or um, presidential or control. What? It's a What? It's just. It's Can I just uh, pose a question to the EOC chair or whoever deems it relevant? I think looking at whatever action we take and I hope we take it swiftly and I hope we take it in good confidence to make sure that an important point is addressed and it may have been addressed in the conversation. But as EOC chair, you don't have to get too specific on this. Is there any privileged information given to you in the process of running that position that would positively or advantageously affect your participation in a future election, whether it be an executive election or whether it be a Senate election? So, yeah, so, so in my opinion, there's nothing that the EOC while they're actively serving, that can positively affect them in the future, just because of the fact that since you serve for an academic year, when the next... Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I want to make sure everybody is clear on this, so keep asking questions, please. I know you're trying to So, uh, can we repeat the question? I'm sorry. I'm like, oh, please. What was it? Oh, is there oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's like a huge midterm week for me, I'm so sorry. Um, so, in my opinion, there is nothing that current EOC members can do that would positively or negatively affect them in future academic years, because since the EOC chairman and members run or have their positions for that academic year, and their purview is only within the election packets that are passed during that academic year, any changes that are made would be completely re-reviewed by EOC the following year. So there's really no way that you could slip something in that wouldn't be caught either by the next EOC or Student Affairs, which certifies that the people who are running are able to run. So that's the second layer of security. And of course, the EOC sends all of their uh, all of their policy violations and all of the elections information to the judiciary, which then recertifies. We certify those results. And then, of course, we work very closely with Senate leadership for elections overall. So, in my opinion, there are so many layers of checks and balances just in a single election that because of that, there, there's really no way that you can kind of, you know, like 
probably fix it to work out for you because it's going to get rechecked you'll probably eight more times before you can even work so, Does that answer your question? Thank you, Claudia. Uh, on point information, uh, Senator, do you know this uh, wording was like your text? Yeah. All right. There's a motion to the previous question. That is to move back to the amendment. Second goes to more. Is there any discussion on this motion? You can't have discussion. That would be good. That's good. I do disagree. Um, all right. Uh, seeing that we'll move to a vote. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying yes. Any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have the motion to right, So now we're moving. Now we're going to have a, a vote on the amendment proposed. That being, therefore, be finally resolved that this change shall only apply to members not yet confirmed to the Election Oversight Committee as, as of the passage of this bill. All those in favor of this amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying nay. Any abstentions? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have the motion carries. Now we will move back into consideration of the bill as a whole. Are there any other points of discussion? Um, I just want to say really quickly too. Don't think. One thing I think for the reason of, you know, obviously we want to prevent having conflicts of interest, but I think another big reason for having that rule where um, if you are on the EOC you can't run for an election is because they want it to be a deterrent um, so that we don't have, like, you know, freshmen coming in, running the whole election, learning about the entire way that that thing works, then going out and doing it um, next year, potentially having some advantage. And I think it's one of those things where being on the EOC is a big privilege, but at the same time, you know, you're overseeing the election, and I just don't think that, you know, it would be fair if, like, a freshman could come in and get, you know, even if you say that there's not a lot of, like, you know, tactical information you can gain from being on the EOC, I think it's still, you know, if there's anything at all that's gained from them being on it, it's still a disadvantage for other people. So I think it's fine the way it is. I mean, it has, it's not broken. The system's not broken. So I don't really think that it needs to be fixed at all. Um, you know, because especially, like, you don't want people that aren't experienced with USG on the EOC in the way that the election goes. So you want people to have a good background. And I think having this, um, you know, this limit where you can't run for elected office afterwards really makes people think twice about why you join. You know, that makes any sense. You know? Yeah. You know? yeah. All right. Uh, now we will recognize Vice President. Nope. Nope. Uh, uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, she was saying that, like, uh, she wants to have her. She's Yes. Yeah. No, no, no. It just means, it just means from this point forward. Everyone can talk if they're made, or I can read about this. All right. All right. See ya. <laughs> okay, she kind of sent like multiple messages, so I'm just going to try to make it cohesive. Okay, so Anna said, I agree that this inhibits membership, however, it should be a priority to reduce conflict of interest as much as possible, especially in our elections. We want to make sure that the candidates have no stake in the process whatsoever. Despite this, I do recognize that this could definitely hinder membership, so a potential compromise is the following. After serving on the EOC committee for an academic year, you are ineligible to run for the subsequent year. You can, however, run the year after that. This would allow young members of the organization, such as sophomores, to still have the opportunity to be a senator. 
in the year they are ineligible to run, they can join a committee, serve an appointed position, etc. Otherwise, I don't think it would be the best idea to allow EOC members after serving to run for a position anytime. Sorry, for there's like feedback on this mic. Big conflict of interest, in my opinion. Then I said this. I definitely understand. This makes sense. People will do. Sorry, I think it's like a response to you. I definitely understand that reasoning too. People will definitely question a little when brought to Senate oh, if we said that people could immediately run right after serving on the EOC. I think this is a good middle ground in anticipation of the different viewpoints and circumstances that may arise on both ends of the spectrum. Thank you so much for giving me more background on your thought process. Yeah, okay, that's it. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for the background. Oh, this is what she said to Josh in the summer. Uh, I would just like to reiterate that uh, the chairperson has said it is the opinion of Senate leadership that serving on the election uh, oversight committee does not give you an advantage in the coming election. I believe Chairperson Reynolds also just uh, did ask that on a, on a point of information. Uh, responding directly to what the, the president uh, just said, uh, I, given, uh, given what I just said, I do think that it is still a good idea for say, a sophomore to be able to run, uh, a sophomore who sat on the election oversight committee to be able to run against a junior, uh, especially given that it does not give them any uh, positive advantage. Next on the speaker's list, Senator Jackson. So thank you. Not only do I agree with Deputy Speaker Douglas, but I'd also like to point out a common misconception that I feel going on in this room, and that is that USG elections are competitive because time and time again, they have proven not to be. Um, there are senators in this room that have won with 12 votes. There are people out there that could have won with 10 right in the votes. I don't think that we should be focusing on an issue of what sounds like being misconstrued as corruption as much as focusing on how can we get more people to join? How can we get people in this room to debate? How can we get more voices heard on behalf of the city of Thank you, are you? Uh, uh, well, Senator Cotton, I have point speaker. So, uh, yeah, you're up. Uh, I um, I guess, uh, like here in the debate, that's a great point. Is there any data to say that, like, that when this, like, um, when when the original laws were set, that, that was set because there had been some some incident? Is there like any evidence where like anyone's ever ever actually used the EOC in any way to to get an advantage? I don't know who to specifically ask that to, but if anyone would like to answer that. Um, also, like. Also, question. Point work. Great information. Yes. It. Yes, he has a lot to uh, ask questions during discussion. As, uh, as a new rhetorical sense, if you're actually looking for an answer on that, then that will be raised as a point of information. If you're using it to emphasize your point, then no. Like, I figured someone will answer it anyways, so like, I'll just keep it. Um, but, like, I'm also just generally curious, like, if it doesn't get passed, is there any, like, thought of, like, what the solution is, like, to, to the fact that there is one member on the board? And then, like, lastly, like, the original reason I actually uh, wanted to speak was because I think, like, I think Alma's, uh, President Alma's idea is a great idea, I think, like, in terms of like like trying to get people more involved, it handles that as well as you know still kind of keeps a lot of layers of security in terms of 
the integrity of our elections. And so I think I think generally, like instead of trying to look at it for like either way, maybe we should just try to amend the bill until there's a compromise. So I yield my time to this. I appreciate it. Next on the speaker's list, Comptroller Topic. All right. Next, uh, EOC Chair Carroll. So, I just want to start off by saying, when I was uh, chosen for this position, I, I did say that my primary goal in overseeing the elections was to also increase participation in elections, because as we all know, as a fellow senator, or as uh, senator, yeah, really. as we've already said, uh, participation in USG, especially in the elected positions, is low, and to answer the question that somebody one of, my, one of these senators asked, um, if this doesn't get passed, meaning if we do not have a case where we're able to get enough people to join the EOC under the current rules and the current bylaws, um, there's no official uh, response, there's no official solution yet, but there's been a lot of solutions that have been floated that I'm not especially comfortable with. There's been an idea that maybe the justices, and I'm saying this out of transparency, there's an idea that maybe the justices would sit in on the EOC, which to me is a bigger point of corruption in itself than, than removing this rule. Uh, there's ideas of having Senate leadership just sit on it. I mean, to me, the whole purpose of this, of the EOC, is to add an extra layer of security to our elections to make sure that people are overseeing you know, the election results beyond just the bodies that are currently looking at it, which includes the Common Student Affairs Department, Zen Leadership, the Governing Board, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to make that point now. Uh, to answer one of Owen's points, uh, Senator Bonaventure's points, uh, the chair of the EOC is decided by letter of intent, which is sent to the Governing Board. So there really isn't the chance, you know, although freshmen or sophomores would be able to join the EOC, the chairman of the EOC, uh, who really you know, holds that, that ultimate power in the end, you know, that we're kind of concerned about, that person would be vetted by our governing board. So I would say that's not a concern in itself, in my opinion. Uh, to me, the system is broken, just to answer that point, because again, no one wants to run for this position. And if that happens, then we're going to have to jerry-rig some type of crazy solution to get people on the EOC, which is going to be more dangerous in and of itself than just getting rid of this solution, than getting rid of this uh, restriction. Um, to answer the uh, President's point, uh, I feel like adding this year, this like extra year complication is just adding more confusion to our rules. I don't really see the necessity of it, um, because if we want to prevent you know, I don't really see a case where freshmen or sophomores are going to be like trying to join this committee anyway. I mean, period. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, nobody really considers this as like something that they want to join, which again is the reason why we don't have people running, running for it. It also just adds a confusing layer that I feel like is unnecessary and further restrict membership to the EOC, which is exactly what we're trying to prevent by doing by passing this amendment. Um, I'm not aware of any. Cases. I, I think somebody, somebody on our governing board might be aware, but I'm not aware of any cases where this has resulted in corruption that we're aware of. Um, you know, and I would just repeat that the, the EOC is not the be all end all of elections. It's simply an added layer of security to our elections. It's not like we hold all the power in the world. I mean, we just passed an amendment that said the Chief Justice is going to control the timeline. So, you know, I, I think part of the problem with this is that people don't really understand what the EOC does. We create the elections packet, right, based off of the information in our bylaws and the Senate rules. Uh, we do all the calculations, and then those calculations for how many seats are available and all the other information is then verified by Student Affairs, our governing board, the Senate leadership, et cetera. Um, we also receive we receive complaints and policy violations that people send in, and then we send those off to the Chief Justice and the Judiciary. And uh, we, we basically just act as a middleman between student affairs and uh, and the USG leadership. So, you know, although we're, 
it's an important role. It's not like, uh, I personally, and as a member of the ESC, I personally do not see any way that this could harm anyone. And I mean, again, if the concern is that, uh, if the concern is against me, I'm totally fine with the, the clause that we have that restricts me from running for anything. Because again, my, my primary purpose is to get people onto EOC so that we can get people in USG. That's the only point of this. So I mean, I guess. Uh, point of information for the What's that? Uh, point of information for the Yeah. yeah. Um, so the big things that EOC rule that people might most think about is Election tickets that divides up the seats. Um, what is that done? Is that done like, um, like you're looking at that now? Would that affect next year's election? No, because that information is based off of residency numbers that student affairs provides us for each block of campus. Yes. So we have no way. We follow standard percentages and standard <coughs> regulations to set how many seats are available in a bunch of sets. So that's another case of other oversight by other Thank you. Uh, thank you. Motion to the previous question and the second. <laughs> All those in favor of moving back to just uh, to moving to a vote on the bill, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Any abstentions? No, we cannot. Uh, the opinion of the chair, the ayes have motion carried. All right. Now. We're going to move into a vote on the bill itself. Yes, I, I motion to vote uh, roll call. So what she's done is she's motioned to vote by the roll, which means I believe this requires second and a civil majority. No, it doesn't. It's just, it's just a privilege. So she's called for a roll call vote. What that means is now what we will do is we will read through all the senators here and vote. Each of you will stand up and say your vote, whether you vote in favor, against, or abstain. What order? We have to vote with uh, a lot of them. Do you want to vote by a you know, conventional method? No. In the bylaws of the Constitution, uh, every oh, senator right. is right. right. the student government has the privilege of all votes. It does not require a conventional Will you, for reference, that one? Yeah. All right. So now that there is a motion, we will now move into voting by the roll. So you got it. Okay. So give me a moment. All right. So Senator Alabal. Senator Von Ventura. Senator Kotlash. Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, yeah, do I understand that? Okay. Uh, do I just say I do? Yes. If you, yes. Yes, I do. Right. Senator Chabakwala. <coughs> Senator Chilajulu. Senator Chiribabu. Senator Contreras. Aye. I'm going to abstain. It's the chair. Senator Douglas. Vote in favor. Senator Earl. In favor. Senator Fernando. In favor. Senator Fadawala. In favor. Um, in favor. In favor. I'm going to repeat that, Senator. In favor. Make sure, guys, when you, you say it, you stand up and say it. That way you just project more. So, um, um, Senator Glasson. Aye. There you go. <laughs> yes. Senator Hassan. Aye. Senator Joffrey. Nay. 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 Senator Karowski. Aye. Senator Knight. Aye. Senator Lau. In favor. Senator Makaro. Senator McEnany. In favor. Uh, Senator McCormick. Aye. Senator Bima. Aye. Senator Moore. Aye. 
Senator Nay. Uh, Senator Nanadol. Senator O'Connor. <coughs> Senator O'Dell. Aye. <coughs> Senator Pan. Aye. Senator Pratt. Senator Ayuka. Senator Reynolds. Aye. Senator Thacker. Aye. Senator Tiberio. Aye. Senator Wurstler. Senator Wotina. Aye. Senator Zantzowitz. Aye. Senator Zahn. Uh, did Senator Joffrey repeat her vote? Yeah, she changed her vote. She said she was nine? Yes. Yeah, you have to stand up and say Okay. Yeah, you just say I would like to change my vote. Okay. Um, I just wanted to announce that I was a little confused what actually was being voted on, so I said nay, but I am actually in favor, so I'm changing my vote to five. And just to clarify, in the future on all roll call motions, or even on any motion, before the vote has been called by the chair, you have the right to change your vote. Right. With that, give us a moment to tally. And I believe the, the vote stands 23 in favor, two against, zero out of the same. The motion clearly passes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just making sure everyone's away. So next Friday, the 26th, not this Friday, but the next Friday, um, Conberg and the New Voters Pro Project, in partnership with a lot of the student organizations on campus, are sponsoring a ballot-ready party from 1 to 4 p.m. It will be on the Student Union Terrace outside. Um, USG will be having a table um, out there. Uh, we will shortly be reaching out for volunteers for that table from 1 to 4. We'd love all the help we can get. We're going to be giving out some cool swag and promotional items, along with promoting probably our elections and USG in general. So I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there and hoping to get some good volunteers for that event. I yield. All right. All right. Uh, next we'll have Senator Douglas. Uh, 
first thing, I want to echo what the speaker just said. Great job tonight. Uh, we got a lot of uh, great discussion. I look forward to more of that going forward. Uh, the second thing is, the election packet is out. So if any of you have friends who want to run in elections, or if any of you have friends, convince them to run in elections, uh, so we can get this room more filled and we can have more great discussions like that. Yosef Chair. Uh, next is Senator Glass. All right, so hi everyone. So tomorrow night is Thursday night. That means game night. So SOC, uh, 7 o'clock. Uh, I hope uh, we can get some new faces in for that. That's a good question. What do you think, Speaker? Well, it could be Skip Bo, it could be Uno, or somebody else with the Zucal. We got, we got Skip Bo, Uno, and Cards Against the Humanity so far, so we'll figure it out that. Thank you for a really good night. I just wanted to congratulate you all uh, who spoke and you know who voted and just was here in general. Um, it was a really good night. I like to think. Um, I so we are compiling a contact list for all the senators, including their office hours and their phone numbers and emails and all of that. If you are uncomfortable with your phone number or any piece of information um, being public like that, then just let me know. And also, if I don't have your phone number, please give it to me at some point. Thank you. Senator Kaplash. Uh, just one announcement. Um, like as part of this uh, initiative, I forget who brought it up. Um, to get people registered to vote, there's still lots of opportunities to do so and to get involved. So if you guys have any more questions on getting involved, registering people to vote, all that kind of stuff, you guys can talk to Justin Kaiser at the back. He can give you a lot more information on that. But please get involved. Like as we all know, election rates and like turnout rates are very low. Yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, apologies, I know we all want to get out of here, uh, but Senator Cavish just reminded me, uh, voter registration deadline, 30th, to be online. So if you have not yet registered to vote, go ahead and do that. If anyone has questions about that, find her or people in them, or find Senator Cavish, he will help you with that. All right. So, I'm going to motion to you adjourn by unanimous consent. Are there any objections? Seeing none, we will adjourn. John, Matt.